you very much, um, Winnie, for agreeing to um, have this very intimate session with uh, question and answers. So, um, sure. And we really appreciated your keynote this morning. Um, that was an excellent oh, thanks. introduction. So thank you very much. So you heard what I had to say and you still came. Yes. That's good. <laughs> So um, you're, you're in an audience of friends here, which Good. is lovely. Um, so the, the session, um, we also want to thank um, Pearson's for sponsoring the session. And, yes, um, thank you, Pearson. Which has been a really lovely thing um, for you to do. The idea is that we are going to just, um, have, we've got some questions that we really want to find out from you. Um, and we've been asking our membership for the Children, Young People and Family Specialist section who um, here is the committee. Um, so we've got Yes, Deborah. I've been seeing all of your, Hello. get those questions in. Yes, <laughs> and, and Ben. So we've been very active on, on social media trying to get some questions, and we've got probably too many that... Uh, <laughs> we'll but, pick good ones But then. we are going to pick some good ones, and we can also invite um, the audience to, to ask some questions. Sure. Um, so as you know, the um, event is being filmed. Um, so if anybody doesn't want to be filmed, then um, just make yourself known, and, and you can go to the, to the back left. Um, so just to start off, um, I, I just want to, is, um, is everybody in here children's occupational therapist? Who's, who's a children's occupational therapist? Great. And then who else do we have in the audience? Learning disabilities. Learning disabilities mental health and older people. Great. So we've got to, we've got to start. All the people. This is about <laughs> all the people. Yes. Older, Brilliant. Older, older people. people. Wider Fantastic. So we've got we've got a really good spread. So I'm going to um, just check that I haven't forgotten anything, and otherwise I'm going to hand over to um, our first uh, person who's going to ask a question. Um, any thoughts on an association between hypermobility and sensory needs? Um, and the question here with the person has written challenge and challenge of managing sensory seeking behaviour and fatigue with stroke pacing needs. So is are they or is it hypermobility in your joints or? Um, I think kind of probably I'm thinking of unless anyone here knows specifically that question. I know specifically, it, oh okay. It was joint hypermobility. Joint hypermobility. So the person is um, unsafe, like their their mobility in their joints is unsafe. No, I think the question was relating to fatigue and pacing rather than subluxations. Oh, well you know. Um, People that are seekers are going to continue to be seekers. Um, so our job as OTs then is to ask ourselves what would be all the ways that this person could get their sensory seeking needs met. You know, and that's where we need to know is it touch or movement or proprioception or um, auditory, visual, touch. Uh, what are the things that the person is actually seeking and what are alternate ways that we can meet those needs um, that aren't going to like overtax the person or over um, tax their joints or um, make them have the kind of fatigue that interferes? Because interfering, behaviors that interfere with um, your engagement in everyday life is the part that we care about, you know? And so um, there certainly are seeking behaviors that are facilitating to participation, and there are seeking behaviors that would wear us out. So if a, if a kid, for example, needs, I actually served a little boy um, who was a very high sensation seeker for um, movement, for vestibular input, and uh, it was quite a challenge. Uh, I was serving the family, and it was quite a challenge to get him ready every day because he kept fleeing the getting dressed routine to get his movement needs met. And so what we did, and this is where, what I mean about finding a way to situate it in the person's life, we moved all of his clothes to inconvenient locations. So his shoes were all in the basement, and his socks were in the, with the um, sheets in the hallway, and nothing was at eye level. It was either under his bed, or he had to get a, a ladder or a little step stool to climb up and get it. So what we did was we repositioned his um, getting his vestibular needs met within the, the cognitive job called getting dressed. So underneath the banner of getting dressed, he had to run around to gather up all the stuff every day. And so do you see like that respects his need to have a lot of movement, but it adds the template of purpose 
because getting dressed was something he needed to get done so that he could get on to school. So this idea about um, letting a kid just, or an adult even, you know, just like run wild um, isn't very useful to, to living. So that was an example of a way that I situated his need. I didn't try to take it away from him. I didn't try to satiate it and then get dressed. I asked myself, how can getting dressed include a lot of movement? Do you see the difference? It's, it's a subtle difference, but to me it's a critical one. We're smart enough as OTs to think this way. We're smart enough to hear any family's story and find the therapeutic opportunity inside of it. We just don't trust ourselves sometimes to be willing to think that deeply. So I don't know if that's what the person wanted, but that's what he or she's getting. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, another question that I've been asked to ask um, on a different uh, topic. If you have funding for a randomized controlled trial, what area of occupational therapy would you spend it on? If I had funding, um, I would, today, I would spend it on uh, coaching. Oh. Because there's a lot of evidence, there's a lot of interdisciplinary evidence about the effects, the positive impact of coaching practices on executives and business, on um, uh, teachers in classrooms, on um, young people that are in college and graduate school, on people in retirement trying to figure out what they're doing. There's a ton of really solid evidence that coaching practices um, are an effective method for delivering information. Uh, basically what coaching does is um, it, it allows you to use your expertise by asking the right questions instead of giving the right answers. And so um, we've done a couple of studies so far and we use sensory processing as a template of information for the families, for example. But what we're doing is um, we never give the families advice. What we're learning is that when you tell the parents what to do, they stop talking. They become sort of passive recipients of information. And then they either do or don't do. I Haven't every single one of you gotten advice from somebody and you didn't do it? Because you still get to decide about your own life. And the advantage of coaching is we never give the advice. We just keep asking the questions. And what the families tell us at the end and what teachers tell us after coaching is they say things like, I thought of all those ideas. They were all my ideas. You stood with me to help me figure them out. An interesting thing is that um, in one of our studies, every week the, the families would make a, uh, a plan. And then the next week we would say, so how'd that go? How'd your idea work out? And 51% of the time, the plan did not work. 51% of the time, across 20 families, 10 sessions each. Half the time, the plans didn't work. And I think that's what the active ingredient was. Because then the family and we had to think more deeply. Why do you think it was hard for him when you did that? Well, you know, I, I was thinking about his sensitivity to sound and I put earphones on him. Well, he's sensitive to touch too, so then he pulled the earphones off. You know, so it's like, yeah, that was a great idea, except it didn't work. So, so now what are we gonna try? You know, and the parents would tell us that there, our belief, our behavior that indicated we believed that they could think about another idea, that they were smart enough to come up with a new plan was what really drove them forward. So that's what I would do. I would do, I would do coaching. So you define coaching as supporting people to believe that they can develop more ideas and go further into their problem. And, and they can. It. Mm. They, um, I was given a talk one time <laughs> about this and I had this group of four people in the front row that were grandparents of a kid that had just been diagnosed with autism. And they were all, they were at this little autism conference, a little local conference. And I was talking about all this. And, and uh, a woman in the back that was from another discipline, of course, because no OT would ever say this, I hope. Um, she stood up and she said, she said, you don't know the people I serve. 
you know, basically they're not smart enough to come up with ideas. You know, that, you know, like she just said some bad words about poverty and all these, you know, just bad words. And I don't remember saying this, but one of my doctoral students was in the room, and he afterwards he's like, I can't believe you said that. It was so great, you know. But I had these four grandparents in the front. I was like, what can I do to make sure they know that what this woman just said was unacceptable? It's just unacceptable behavior in any condition. So I apparently said... Um, are they alive from week to week when you go see them? <laughs> you know, and the woman was like, well, yeah. I said, well, apparently they have some ideas then, because they ate, they drank, they slept, they washed, and they got to your session. And so it was a little bit impertinent, but um, I think these grandparents were sort of like, okay, you know, it doesn't matter what our family demographics are. We can be successful. Thank so, you. You're welcome. I know that's what not what you expected, but no, yes. it matters to me right now. I'm from the Royal College of Occupational Therapists, and we have produced a briefing. Um, oh, on... I know. <laughs> and I would just one say of that... your members snuck it to me. Yes, it's a, a briefing for members on 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 sensor oh. integration, but but. But it's wiser than that. It's about children and, and young and adults that have sensory problems. Or and differences. It's, it's, it's differences. And so it is something about how, um, how occupational therapists can work with, with, with people with sensory differences. So it's, and I would, it's fair to say that it's had a very mixed reception. I'm sure. So it's challenging. It's uh, and it, so I suppose what I'm asking you is your perceptions. You've 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 read the briefing. You've seen it. I think and... I think someone sent it to me before the ink was dry. Right. <laughs> it's like seriously, I I got it really fast. Right. So I'd be very interested to hear your your perceptions well, on that. Yeah. I um, first of all, you know, doing the right thing isn't easy. You know, it's easy to just keep going along and. Like if you have a allowed membership that believes a certain thing to keep feeding the beast. But I think the, the role of a professional society is to set a high standard because young people especially look to the to the professional society, whatever you say they think must be evidence based or must be backed up by something because that's what they they have so much trust in you as a professional society. So when we um, are um, Namby pamby about what we think, we leave people with um, who really want to do the right thing in their work. They really want to do the best thing possible for the people they serve. We leave them with um, this vulnerability to be susceptible to whatever anybody says to them. So, what I was so happy about was that your organization was was courageous to stand up you know, use people that had a good, solid academic background to look up things and summarize them and say what needed to be said. Um, does that ruffle feathers? Of course it does. I had a principal one time, he said, if you haven't ruffled any feathers in a week, you probably didn't do much. You know, like, like that's, that's what your society should be for, is to stand up and be counted about what is good, excellent OT practice. So... Um, I say the fact that you're getting mixed reviews means you did something courageous. Yeah. It, it started a discussion, and I think it's something about it's very good to, to, to bring something to the table and open the discussion Absolutely. and discuss things openly. Absolutely. So it's very helpful to have your perspectives on that. Well, I'm, I'm really proud of you. Thank you. I'm really proud of you for doing it. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, OT is about life. We have to start making all of our policies and all of our standards be about people's lives, not about procedures, not about methods, but about how we affect a person's life. Because even a really cool method, if it doesn't, you know, like if I work on a kid's balance and he still can't get on the bus, like who cares? Who cares if he got a better score on a test about balance? You know, what matters is can he get on the bus? You know, and, and so... If OT doesn't stand up for that on people's behalf, then who's going to? You know, we have to do it. We don't have time to mess around. 
and figured out 10 years later, these children are growing up. We've got to be strong and, and focus on their lives every day. You know, another thing, their lives, an hour of a kid's life, an hour of a family's life is an hour of your life too, by the way. Like, like how do you want to spend it? How, how do you want your legacy to look? That you just went through procedures or that you affected their life deeply by giving them the tools to be more effective every day, more happy, more whatever. So, good on you. Oh my God, that is not something we say in the United States. I've been here too long already. <laughs> I think this question links on to what you were just saying. Oh, okay. Um, so you may have already answered it, but you might have something Oh, to I'll be happy to talk some more about it. Um, so with sensory being a controversial area of practice, how do we bring a divided profession together? Okay, say it again. With, sen with sensory being a controversial area of practice, how do we bring a divided profession together? Uh, you know, people make a choice about being divided. Um, like at the beginning you asked me about sensory integration. Well, that's just not my, that's not my area. You know, it's not something that I can comment on. Um, but for example, um, the controversy in the United States is related to um, uh, this idea of sensory integration as air sensory integration or all the other things that sensory processing informs us about in our practice. And so one of the ways that I've helped people ex help people understand it is if you look at um, the scope of practice for OT, um, I think that classic sensory integration has a much stronger emphasis on person factors, you know, with the idea that the issue is situated inside the person. And therefore, the kinds of interventions you would choose would be ones that affect the person variables. And I would say that the stuff we've been talking about today with related to sensory processing is situated in the places, the context, the environment, and the activities. You know, how do we make, knowing what someone's sensory patterns are, how do we make those activities more accessible? How do we make those environments more friendly for them? Um, that's equivalently a tool of occupational therapy practice. Um, and that's, that's the part that I focus on. You know, one of the things I think we're, um, we're dealing with right now is that our profession is maturing. And if you look at the history of medicine and psychology and some of the professions that are older than us, we, every discipline goes through this, where we're all, and OT's probably more guilty of this than others. We, <laughs> we want to be nice all the time, you know, and so it upsets us when people have differences of opinion. But the truth is a mature discipline has a lot of that. And it, it's vigorous and people are willing to ask hard questions and, and new graduates aren't willing to just do something because somebody told them to do it. Um, you know, 15 years ago, if you asked a new grad, how do you know what to do? They'd say, well, my supervisor told me or so and so, you know, now, I mean, as soon as a question comes out of the mouth of someone in class, the students are looking it up. They're like, um, there aren't any articles about that. Like, we're, 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 we have new tools today. And so vigorous debate is healthy for a profession. And um, it requires the people that have certain opinions to stand up and be counted. It requires them to do studies that are convincing to the rest of us, not only to us, but to all the other people, the physicians, the nurses, the um, educators. You know, they have a right to expect us to have high standards as well. In fact, it's their responsibility. So I don't think that it's um, a bad thing to have this vigorous debate, but I do think it puts more responsibility on all of us in practice to be willing to look at the material and make a decision about what our beliefs are gonna stand on. You know, what evidence are you gonna stand on to make your decisions with a, with a person and their family, so. Following on from that, yeah. um, we had a question just sort of looking at which sensory strategies do you feel are supported by the evidence then to have a positive impact on that? occupational performance? Obviously. Well, you know, I, I talked about a lot of the evidence this morning. That scoping review we did was very informative. Um, I think, though, I told other people, we, we got to be willing to look at, let, at the literature outside of OT. Um, we have to be willing to look at the education literature. We have to be willing to look at psychology, at neuroscience. Um, and 
That scoping review had 260 articles across a 10-year period. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? But a lot of the things I told you guys this morning is from other disciplines because they're interested, they use our material as their background for the study they're going to do. You know, that's also the mark of a mature discipline is that other people start using our material. Other people start coming to us for information. So um, what, what that evidence told us was that um, when we situate things in uh, people's everyday routines, we have better outcomes. When we um, empower the care providers, the families, um, the teachers, uh, we have better outcomes. And, and part of that is because um, when children get opportunities over and over, and this is from the early childhood literature, you know, um, when uh, Carl uh, Dunst did a lot of work about um, teaching skills to young children, and what he found was if you teach a skill to a kid, like just one-on-one, -on -one, teach, 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 their skill set goes up really fast but they don't use that skill anyplace else except when they're being prompted by the provider, the teacher or the therapist. Um, and when you like uh, talk to the family, like let's say a kid needs to reach and grasp, so then you talk to the family about all the chances, the preschool teacher, all the times during the day when reaching and grasping is necessary to do the activities. So reaching and grasping the juice box and reaching and grasping a color, um, reaching and grasping to get your coat off the rack, you know, all those things. When you generate all those ideas, reaching and grasping doesn't go up like this. It, it kind of slowly, uh, uh, you know, ascends. But what else happens that's very important? The next time the child needs to use reaching and grasping, they're like, you know, I used it to get my coat. I bet I can use it to get my book. So that generalization is better. So we know from other evidence, and, and then OTs have used it in their studies, that when we situate um, our ideas inside of those routines, the routines themselves support the child to have more practice, and then they, they do better. So really it's those occupation-focused interventions yes. as opposed to component skills. Yes, it is. Um, we, it, some, somehow we think that it makes us feel more like a therapist to have a fancy procedure or a method, you know, or a device, even better, you know. But, you know, the device is, it might be the toilet paper roll, you know. Doo -doo -doo! You know, like, what can you do with a toilet paper roll? I had, a, I had somebody ask me one time, you know, like, well, this family doesn't have anything to play with in their home. That's another way to say they're poor. You know, people have lots of sentences that secretly. And um, I'm like, really? You know, like how many of us have told stories about the expensive toy we bought our child and what happened? <laughs> they played with the box. They played with the box. Like, like, you know, and that's to me the limitation of our own thinking where we think we have to look like a therapist instead of look like um, a relevant provider. You know, you don't take any special things in. You just, like, trust yourself that no matter what's in that house, you're going to find something. Or what's in that preschool room, you're going to see the opportunities. And to me, uh, the evidence supports that. And um, I personally, I think that's a more satisfying way to practice, too. Because you just never know. You just never know what they're going to say. You got to... I've had many times when... Um, an adolescent would tell me something they wanted to work on, and I had to, you know, like Pokemon back when it just started. I was like, oh, my God, I have no idea what that is. I'm like, sure. You know, and then I'm like, you know, what, what is that? You know, so, um, but we have to trust ourselves. We have to trust. Um, let me tell you a story about a family. Um, we had an assignment about 10 years ago, maybe 15 now, um, where the students had to get on a, um, a family support uh, chat room. They weren't allowed to talk, but, but we told the chat room they're going to listen in, and it was adults, family members who had adults that had brain injury. So they were just, we wanted them to see the kind of things that families talk about when they're not in therapy sessions. So uh, one of the women that was on the chat room, she couldn't help herself. She goes, you, I know you OTs are out there. <laughs> She goes, you know, I have a question. You know, well, the students were just paralyzed because we told them do not respond to, you know, do not participate in the conversation. So, you know, one of us co contacted the mother, the wife. It was actually a wife. And she said something just, like, so incredible. She said, um, 
she told us the story that this OT was serving her and her husband. Her husband was a, a prison guard, um, and he'd had a head injury, and uh, the OT was having him cook, and she kept telling the wife, you know, cooking has a lot of cognition in it, because that was one of the, the things that they were trying to work on. It has a lot of cognitive things in it, blah, blah, blah. And the wife was just, like, fit to be tied, because this OT was so procedural about cooking, she said, my husband has not cooked a day in his life, and because he has something that I now know is called perseveration, he keeps serving the food until we eat it, even though it's really bad food. And then she paused, and she said, this is the brilliant part. I don't know anything about this cognition thing, but I'm betting there's something cognitive about his job at the prison. Why don't we find out about that? Like, why didn't the OT think of that, right? Common sense. It's not common. <laughs> it's OT sense. <laughs> OT common sense. Yeah. So we, you know, we, we, we act like that's nothing. But it's, it's everything. That if we would have trusted this woman to tell the story of their family, that the, the OT would have been able to figure out the cognitive opportunities in the prison guard job. Or maybe go over to the prison and see what's going on over there. Do you see... And how many of us in our weak moments have taken an easy way instead of the right way? So, yeah. yeah thank you. Thanks. Hi, Winnie. My name's Bev, and I work with adults with a learning disability. Perfect. Right. Um, Some of my favorite people. Right, great. It's a brilliant field to work in. Um, we have an increasing number of uh, people with a learning disability being referred for a sensory assessment, usually with profound uh, disability, severe disability, or behaviours that challenge, and we're being asked for a sensory assessment. Now, we've tried various, my colleagues and I, assessments, um, and haven't really found anything that doesn't have a self-reporting element to it. Mm -hmm. We just wondered for adults. That for an adult, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, so we've tried. I've tried your adolescence and adult sensory profile, but not really been able to get anything that's kind of valid to help us. Are these it's people? Um, are they living in their own homes? Are they in a it care varies. facility? It could be in a care facility, group home. It could be because um, my my uh, colleague and I, Evan Dean, um, works with adults who have intellectual disabilities, yes. and um, he and I are working on a caregiver report version of an adult version. So right. so um, stand by for news on that. Really, that's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, when I wrote the sensory profile, the first yeah. one, um, it was called, listen to me, the sensory profile. Mm -hmm. Do you notice anything about that phrase? What does the mean? The one. Uh, there was no word about children or adults. You know, it was yeah. the sensory yeah. profile. That shows you how smart I was. Um, the ink wasn't even dry on that one, which was for three to ten year olds, and people were like, "What about the toddlers? What about the babies? What about the adolescents? What about the adults?" You know, and and then what about the teachers? And I thought, I thought, surely, you know, birth to you know ninety five and teachers like surely we're done but no like this happened right when this right <laughs> that's right. about two came out what about all these adults so yeah. uh, it's a never-ending so process we do use caregiver ones but when you put everything together and try yeah. to add it up there's the self-reporting so so the way it. that i here's what i do when i work mm -hmm. with teams that are serving this group of people um I frequently give all the care providers, so whether it's family care providers or professional care providers or aides or whoever it is, I give them all an adult sensory profile to take. Right. Um, because what that does is it gives all the people in that person's life the words to use to describe something. And they might have described the behavior a different way, but then when mm -hmm. they take the adult sensory profile, they're like, you know, sometimes I do rock. Right to calm myself down. You know, I get in my rocker and rock, like, huh. So then they start think, and then they start seeing things about the people they're serving, and they start telling us. So to me, the best ways are for you to do that and for you to um, get them to video 
the person during an easy time of the day and a challenging yeah. time of the day and mm -hmm. sit with those care providers and watch it and see yeah. what words they use to describe what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can give them more words. Yeah. You know, I'm noticing, you know, he, he seems to start rocking every time somebody opens the door over there in the next mm -hmm. room. Like you can hear it in the background and to you and I it's just soft, but apparently it's affecting yeah. him. You know, like, so then they start, because then they're your best asset. Yeah. Because they can start telling you the things that happened about the sheets or about what foods or, uh, we were talking earlier today about um, somebody um, using um, a new uh, fabric softener, you know, and the kid was getting mm -hmm. really irritable and, and it was the smell yeah. of that new fabric softener. Well, the rest of us didn't notice it. Yeah. But some really insightful person noticed that after the fabric softener, then the behavior. You know, So yeah. part of it is helping, getting them to help us parse out which of the behaviors mm -hmm. are, um, have a sensory quality to yeah. them. And which of them, the other thing with adolescents and adults that you're serving is they have habits that might have started as a sensory thing and became a habitual behavior. Yeah. So we have to sort of uncouple that behavior from um, whatever the source is by giving them alternatives, you know. Um, and, and I talk a lot about, you know, it's an adaptive behavior that they're starting to scream because something is too much for them. Let's yeah. figure out what it is. Yeah. Instead of saying they're non-compliant and all, yeah. you know what non-compliant means, don't you? Nobody's doing what I want them to do. <laughs> you know, that's not... That's not no. acceptable language. So we say, like, I wonder what that behavior means. I wonder what we should do about it. Yeah. Let's see if we can do some detective work and figure it out. I so to me, great. that's the best strategy that's to great. use. That's great. And that's, that's great. We kind of do what we could observe. It's just those elements where they're self-reporting. We can't feed that to any kind of valid assessment. Well, the so videos have a effects. really powerful effect yeah. because... Um, you and I notice things that other people don't notice because yeah. of how we've been trained. Yeah. And we can start pointing those things out and then they start telling, yeah. oh my gosh, you're not gonna believe what happened with Thomas you know, after you left last yeah. week. They start telling us more things and then we yeah. can um, sort of build on that information. And just one last comment. Could we change your mind on your next RCT on coaching to be doing some kind of work with an RCT with people with an adult with a learning disability with your assessments? Okay. That would be great. Coaching, coaching them. <laughs> I would coach them too. That'd be great. That'd okay. be great. Thank you. I was just wondering about the development of sensory processing patterns. I was just wondering whether you're thinking it's more about genetics or maybe prenatal complications or maybe the environment, such as I know orphans have um, sensory differences. Well, yeah. Um, you know, everything is genetics and environment. I mean, everything is. That's always an easy answer. But that being said, when we think about... Um, children who have been experiencing really severe end of the spectrum type environments. Um, certainly there, um, we're, all of us have a threshold based on, like if we're in a family that every time, you know, you go to grandma's house, everybody has to get hugged and kissed and whatever, you're gonna have different thresholds from that experience than a person who's in a very formal family where they just greet each other, you know? Um, but, but, but we all have a range. And like, I was, I'm in a family where everybody does a lot of touching and hugging and, and all that. And um, my grandmother just wanted to, she wanted me to sit on her lap and just like be in physical contact all the time. And like, it was past my ability to do so, you know? And so, um, even though that's an acceptable behavior for me, it got to an unacceptable level usually because of her need for it to be continuous. So I think that we all have a range that, um, and, and we want the people we serve to be able to tell us when, they, when we're at the edge of their range, either that they're not noticing on one end or that it's getting to be too much on the other end. I think that children that have been um, in neglect situations um, certainly have lower sensory thresholds because they don't have any experience. But the difference is when you start serving them, if their natural state is more, has more capacity, um, their thresholds will shift as they get experience. You know, kids that are really sensitive, it doesn't matter how much experience you give them, they're just going to continue to be sensitive to things 
all the time. So um, I think we have to be really careful about that. Um, and don't you all have a different threshold day to day? How many of you turn off the radio in your car if the traffic gets bad? Well, that doesn't make your driving better. It makes your cognitive capacity bigger to handle the complicated situation. So it's a, it's, a, it's a constant process of looking at what your capacity is and what the demands of the activity are and how you negotiate those things. So to me, the gift we have to give people is helping them understand that about themselves so they know which parts they can dial up or dial down as needed. Um, it's a big joke in my family. You know, my husband's a bystander. You know, and, and he, he, he works, he owns a pet store, he works in a family-owned retail pet store. He had two different shoes on the whole day. 12 hours on his feet, in the public. He gets home and plops down on the sofa and he looks down at his feet, he's like, oh my, I have two different shoes on. Like how many of you could even get out the door with, you know, one of them was a slip-on. <laughs> the other one was, say it with me, a tie shoe. <laughs> Here's the good news. He is very easygoing. So I don't irritate him as much as I might irritate others because I'm more intense. So, yeah. It's a constant balancing act with our capacity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, if it were included in DSM-5, um, what would be the advantages or disadvantages of SPD, sensory processing disorder diagnosis? Well, thank God it's not. That's all I have to say about that. Um, we got to quit pathologizing everything. You know, characteristics of human beings are variable, and we have to stop acting like any characteristic we find that's different from the expected pattern of the population is necessarily a diagnosis to have. Um, somebody said to me at lunch, you know, well, that's how you, you know, having a diagnosis is like your ticket to get in. It's your ticket to get paid for services. It's your ticket to get a referral. Well, then, you know, what is ours to do? Ours is, our job then is to change the system so that's not the rule. When we over-diagnose people, we break the system. The system's based on having about 10 to 15% of the people needing specific kinds of support. When we have 30% of the people getting diagnosed with anything, um, it creates a problem. Um, I think two things would happen if there was a diagnosis of SPD. Like in America, I don't know about here, people act like it is. People write it in reports yeah, all same. the time. And, um, you know, two things are going to happen if that becomes a reality. Uh, one is that um, kids that already have a diagnosis will just have another one. So kids with autism, kids with ADHD, kids with oppositional defiant disorder, you know, they'll, they'll all just have another. They'll have another diagnosis. And I don't see how that serves us very well. Um, and the second thing that will happen is that um, we will perpetuate the idea that being different is bad. And uh, I would like us to change, I would like OT to be responsible for changing the world's idea about what difference means. It means you're interesting. It means you do things differently than other people and people laugh about it because they never thought to do it that way before. It means a lot of things but nothing negative. And so I'm very sensitive to uh, any of the bad words. Disorder is one of them. So I'm glad that it didn't get in there. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. There was a session earlier in the day um, uh, looking at uh, maternal fetal attachment and various things where it was looking at the mother's sensory patterns and how that influenced attachment. Oh, later. my gosh. Those mothers won't necessarily have had another diagnosis, I would guess. Are you aware of therapists that are working with people who don't have diagnoses and therefore well, haven't bought their like, ticket into the system? Yes. They're called parents. We're working with them all the time. You know, to think that we're only serving children is really like, like get over 
your love of children and look up at the adults because mm -hmm. you're serving them. Um, in my world, and you guys need to get on this because I want it to happen before I die so I know it happened. Um, we would be working in restaurants and grocery stores helping them figure out how to do the produce section to be, res to be respectful of all the people that come through the door. We would be helping the uh, concierge figure out where the best place is to sit by asking two really careful questions of the guests when they come in. We would be, um, the menus would have things on them that would give people a clue about what kind of uh, sensory experience they might have with the food so that um, people could make a choice and not, not be upset by their what they actually get. Um, we would be working in uh, the mall. We would be in the mall if families just have a question and they want to come by and ask. Instead of having clinics where we say all the people that have Down syndrome come so we can say what else is wrong with you, we would have a, a play date for people that they could come and get ideas about what to do next. Um, I think that we're selling ourselves short right now. I think that um, in America, we had this period where uh, Medicare, all the things that paid for services through the health care system um, were, were shifted pretty dramatic, dramatically. And OT um, thrived during that period because we're not so tied to one kind of payer or one kind of system. And I think if we're smart, we're going to get bigger. We're going to work in industry. We're going to work in community centers. We're going to be um, on the boards of our city councils. You know, I, so, when I worked in public school, I was on the reading committee to figure out what books the district was going to buy. And I was successfully able to convince them to buy this one set of books that had, you know how the readers, you know, they're, they're big, heavy books. But this one company had... Um, bound the books, so if it was a big fat book for the fourth graders, they bound it into four parts in four little books. So every classroom then had two sets of those little books for kids that weren't strong enough to hold up the big book or kept dropping it all the time. Like, that's the kind of influence an OT's point of view can have on the whole population. We should be working on playground design. We should be working in daycare centers. We should be working all the places where people show up and helping those places be in service to the people instead of um, people having to have a ticket to get in. Mm. I, I think we need to think bigger about who we are and what, what the possibilities are. Mm. Yes, I come from Gloucestershire, which is just south of here. And in Gloucestershire, we have GCHQ, which is the spy center for Britain. Oh, fun! <laughs> yeah, lots of secret squirrels doing their stuff. And they use, they employ sensory processing trained occupational therapists to keep their people at work because they have some very unique people that work there. Of do course that very they detailed. do. We yeah. need them. Yeah, and they use OTs though to make sure those people can there, continue working. There's an OT in South Africa who uh, were, made a strong argument with the call centers. Uh, because Lombard. because they were having such turnover of workers, and so sh they reorganized their their uh, workforce based on what their sensory needs were and what kind of work setting they needed to be successful, and really turned around mm -hmm. their their um, their recidivism rate. They weren't having people quit so fast because they were getting them into jobs that were a better match. Betty, she never published it, but not in well. Somebody papers. will. Good. Thank you. All right. So. Um, Something that really strikes a chord um, for me, um, recently I saw a post title from a parent. This was a parent of a child with Down syndrome, and the parent title titled this, Don't Say Sorry. And it really strikes a chord with the things you've been saying today. And it's, you know, really, really, you know, hits the spot. Um, so also, um, to finalise, and again, following on from your comment about uh, wanting to think about what's going to happen and in, in the next few years, and so um, one of the, the questions we'd had put to us was to ask you what you see um, the development of your work and, and where is that going to head in the next five years? Well, um, one of the things when you said the family has Down syndrome, it reminded me, um, I've been really... Um, so intently focused on using strength-based approaches. But um, I, I ask myself, well, how do we begin? How do, you know, people say, oh yeah, I want to use a strength-based approach, and then they have no idea what to do. Um, so I started uh, 
taking the summary statements from reports about children and, brought, and putting them up on the board. And, um, and then I would make the audience like rewrite the sentences. We'd practice on some, and then we'd rewrite the rest. Well, one of the times I did that, there was a young couple in the front row, and um, the, the, mo the mother got very visibly upset when I put this description up of this little girl that had pretty complicated uh, conditions. And um, I said, you're upset, tell me, tell me what's going on. And she said something that when I say it, I hear her voice. She said, they wrote that about my daughter. They don't even know her. And I, I, I just decided that day, that was several years ago, then how dare we write something about a family member that the family member doesn't even recognize in our, in our um, shield of professionalism, in our um, hiding behind our big words to sound like we're really smart. Like, we did that to that mom. We did that to her. Like, do any of you want a family or a teacher to walk away and say that? Or do you want them to walk away and say, she totally gets my child. It doesn't mean we have to lie or only talk about the soft things. They know their child's legs are stiff. They can't get the diaper out, for God's sakes. They know it. It's a fact. It's not an indictment. We don't say people suffer from. We don't say, you know, that... You know, they have spastic, quadriplegic, cerebral palsy. Like, you, you know, put that in the back of the report where you have to say what their diagnosis is. That's not who the person is. Who she is is a, a girl that plays with her brother or that's bossy or whatever else the parents would describe. So one of the things is to make sure that people recognize the impact that their words have, their written words and their spoken words. These are not cases to the people who live with the family members. They're people. They're people that tell jokes. Like, let's find out. You know, I'll say to families, what's your favorite thing about Thomas? And they're sh first of all, they're shocked because no one ever asked before. They're ready with their long list of all the stuff that's wrong because you're going to help them. And when I say, well, what do you really like about him? It's not that they don't know. It's that we've taught them we don't. And then they'll say, oh my God, you know, I know that people say that kids with autism are literal, but we think he is hilarious. We think he's hilarious. You know, so why aren't we writing that? Thomas is hilarious in our reports. Um, so that's the direction. Uh, using sensory processing information as, as ways to help people have insight about the impact of the daily life routines on their children, um, helping adults understand that about themselves. Why parent A is the parent to do this with the kid and parent B is the parent to do this with the kid. Helping teachers understand which kids in their classrooms are going to be harder for them to serve because of their sensory processing patterns so that they can um, feel stronger as a teacher about navigating with a diverse group of people in their classroom. And teachers are superb at it if we just give them the information. Do any of you want to be a teacher in front of 30 kids at a time? There's a reason why you didn't pick teacher as your profession. <laughs> so so um, taking the information we, that we've gathered across all this and trying to um, see the universal applications of it is, is where I'm going. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So, I know. It is. It's so much more fun by the way, instead of saying bad things about people. And I think, you know, certainly um, I feel that some of that message is out there. I'm seeing, you know, I work in, in, in services where, you know, you see the impact um, of, the of, the college, of the Royal College of Occupational Therapy and the impact that that has on commissioners, and commissioners are listening. You know, I've, uh, we've got a, a new service specification, and it includes that universal targeted um, level. And I think it gives us scope to do that work now. And um, we have to get up and do it. We can't yeah. just let it be on a piece of paper somewhere. Yeah. We've got to stand up and say, and here's the day when I'm going to do that. I'm going to go to that whole school, and we're going to change how we do the yeah. furniture. 
or we're going to put things on all the chairs so they don't make so much noise. We're going to do universal design. And we need to be more, you know, we need to be able to be more um, ambitious and creative and dynamic about not thinking that everything has to be assessment intervention. We need to think beyond that. And, and, and only we can make that difference right. in our services. Right. So it's but really see, great to hear you see the OT in things. everything. It's yeah. everywhere. Yeah. It's everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. We we just haven't picked it up and played with it yet. Yeah. We will. So it's right, everyone. It's definitely the journey. I hope we see as well in the future. And and from uh, speaking on behalf of uh, the Royal College of Occupational Therapy's specialist section for children, young people and families, thank you enormously mm. for coming and doing this session today. I'm so grateful you so asked me. Grateful. And thank fun. you again to Pearson for sponsoring. Yeah. So I'd just like to ask you to put your hands together and a big thanks oh, for winning thanks. for today's session. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.